Welcome to Inside Games, the only gaming news show brave enough to get shit on by entertainment companies and not post on the internet about it. Yes, Bruce, the show must go on. We can't make it about ourselves. It's about entertainment. We can only guess that must have been what was going through the head of Doom Eternal composer Mick Gordon, who continued to work on the soundtrack despite getting denied payment, legally threatened, and ultimately offered hush money to take the blame for botching the game's OST release over the course of the past two years. Mm -hmm. To hear Gordon tell it, id Software pulled just about every dirty trick in the book on him during the course of Doom Eternal's development, including exploitative stalling tactics and ultimately legal threats. Uh, this left him no other choice but to publish a 50-page, 10,000-word media manifesto chronicling his terrible treatment and damage to his reputation to exercise, quote, my right to defend myself. Oh, that's, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it really is. God, it makes your eyes water a little bit. Uh, uh, in software and specifically executive producer Marty Stratton don't look great right now. And there's a whole lot to this story. Before we cover the specifics of Gordon's recent post, we need to establish some context about where this came from because this is not the first time Mick Gordon and Marty Stratton have publicly beefed before. Yeah, for that, we got to bring in the 2014 Philadelphia State Fair Beefmaster, Charlotte, to give us the grade A on the situation. You want beef? I got beef. Let's get into the saga of how this started, and it is quite a saga indeed. This all started in April of 2020, shortly after the release of Doom Eternal. Now, one thing the franchise has been known for is its music, which has often been composed by Mick Gordon, who has also worked on the Wolfenstein series as well. Gordon's work on the soundtrack for Doom 2016 was particularly well received by fans. It's fucking awesome. Hey, Shook, do me a favor. Hit the audience with a few seconds of BFG Division. Oh, so good. Mm. It's great. But when the Doom Eternal soundtrack came out, some fans had beef with its music. They cited a myriad of issues, such as the final mix being uh, not great. Some players criticized the fact that only 11 of 59 tracks had been mixed by Gordon himself, and the rest had been mixed from in-game music fragments. Blech. Audiophiles even dug in and compared the soundtrack from Doom Eternal to the Doom 2016 music and concluded there wasn't a lot of dynamic range in Doom Eternal tracks. It's just a just a bar all the way across, not a lot of up and down. Anyway, that criticism prompted a response from Gordon, who said he didn't have any role in mixing the soundtrack for Doom Eternal. He added that, quote, you'll be able to spot the small handful of tracks I mixed. So basically he distanced himself from what people mostly agreed was a substandard soundtrack. Yeah, and then id Software fired back in a big and unfortunate way. Yep, in a very long post on the Doom subreddit, Doom Eternal's executive producer Marty Stratton uh, rebutted Gordon's claims about the soundtrack. Yeah, and in an open letter, Stratton blamed Gordon for the soundtrack's poor quality, saying that he'd missed deadlines and then under-delivered, which forced the game's lead audio designer Chad Mossholder to step in and finish the rest of the tracks. Stratton defended Moss Holder and denied speculation that Gordon, quote, wasn't given the time or creative freedom to deliver something different or better. Stratton wrote that, quote, talent aside, we have struggled to connect on some of the more production-related realities of development, while communication around those issues have eroded trust. For id, this has created an unsustainable pattern of project uncertainty and risk. So this prompted no further response from Mick Gordon, which led everyone to believe the matter was settled. Uh, the lingering impression was that Marty Stratton was uncomfortably forced to acknowledge Gordon's poor quality of work. Yeah, the situation played out remarkably and sometimes even uncomfortably similar to the recent incident with former Bayonetta voice actor Helena Taylor. We got a community-loved performer who went public with stories of mistreatment that later didn't sound so accurate. Uh, causing the original person to lose some esteem in the public sphere. Might be worth keeping that in mind based on what we're about to talk about. Uh, maybe you'll detect a cautionary tale or two along the way about jumping to conclusions. Yeah, and all that still applies now. By the way, that's the trick. But first, <laughs> let's whisk you back to a simpler time with our sponsor, Old School RuneScape. Inside Games is brought to you by Old School RuneScape. Rooted in the origins of MMOs, Old School RuneScape is the only everlasting, ever-evolving venture that is shaped by you. It was released way back in 2013, and Old School RuneScape is RuneScape as you used to know it. Based on the 2007 build of the globally popular open-world fantasy MMO, Old School is constantly updated with improvements and new content voted on by you, the fans. The close relationship between developers and players is central to what makes Old School RuneScape so magical. 
and the easiest way to get started in old school RuneScape is Fresh Start Worlds. Fresh Start Worlds is a six month event that's your chance to restart your old school journey. It's the old school RuneScape you know and love except with a fresh economy, fresh high scores, and of course, fresh adventure. All players start as equals with fresh characters with zero skills and play in a reset world with new economy and grand exchange. Characters can then be moved to the main game at any time along with any progression and items earned during Fresh Start Worlds. Then after six months, your progress in Fresh Start Worlds will automatically transfer over to the main game. And that includes everything, items, quest points, skill levels, and your actual soul. Well, maybe. Fresh Start Worlds are available as both free to play and for members. So if you want to sign up for old school RuneScape, start in Fresh Start Worlds, please click the link in the description right below me. I, I promise you, we've all played old school RuneScape. It's so much fun. Just click the link, tell them Inside Games sent you. Thanks, RuneScape. All right, now let's get back to the doom. Yeah, the whole Strat and Call It mess we described before the break, that all played out back in 2020, which was a long time ago at this point. Ugh. Uh, and now this week, live on Medium.com, the beef is back! That's right, this sounds like a job for the beef master. By the way, I take mine whiz wit. Uh, you know, most jobs are for the beef master. This is true. On November 9th, Mick Gordon returned fire with an extensive post of his own refuting Stratton's Reddit post nearly line for line. Yeah, and when we say extensive, we mean you know, more than 14,000 words extensive. Yeah, we're not gonna get into all the specifics because if we did, this video would be three hours long. Mm, yeah, a uh, significant portion of the letter is also Gordon's perspective on the fairness and feasibility of production timelines. Uh, plus, his characterization of Marty Stratton's communication. Um, we'll leave the subjective aspects to Mick Gordon himself in the post if you want to read it. Uh, you can find a link to the post in the description but we're gonna try and stick to the specific events of his mistreatment. All right, all right. Disclosure's done. Charlotte, take us to the Hall of Beef. Buckle up. <laughs> there's a lot. Yeah, yeah I don't lot. even know what to say. I'm overwhelmed. All right, here we go. <laughs> there is a lot here, but we're gonna try to run it all down. Basically, Gordon accused Stratton of lying about the situation in order to blame Mick for the bad response to the soundtrack. In the end, Gordon claimed that Stratton's legal representation offered him a six-figure amount of money to stay quiet about the controversy, effectively accepting the public perception that he'd botched the soundtrack. In his statement, Gordon provided deeper context for the production and deadline issues, claiming that id Software set an aggressive schedule to complete the soundtrack while not providing him gameplay or level design material from Doom Eternal to help with his composition. Worst yet, Gordon's pay was also an issue. He said that id withheld his money for 11 months due to what he called their unwillingness to approve the tracks he submitted. Gordon said that during this time, he dealt with endless demands and severe crunch, Gordon also claims that id Software ended up actually using a lot of the music they'd rejected, writing, quote, id Software had used nearly all the music I produced throughout development, almost five hours worth, while only paying for half of it. Yeesh. He also said that they billed the final soundtrack as, quote, Mick Gordon's original Doom Eternal soundtrack, without his approval or giving him a contract, effectively forcing him into the project before even negotiating a rate or delivery date. He wrote, I hadn't been offered a contract to produce it, I learned about that in the media. Woo! Good job, Charlotte. Man, oh man, that was a lot. I'm beefed out. God damn, I need a burger, you know, <laughs> to, to, to refuel the reserves. God damn, shit. We're not even close to done. Uh, Gordon did eventually receive a contract about a month from the game's release date in 2020, but only then after going over id Software and contacting Bethesda directly. Uh, toward the end of id's deadline to finish the soundtrack, Mick Gordon said he was working 18 to 20 hour days and sleeping under his desk, even during Easter weekend. Mm, uh, after all the crunching, Gordon said he was told to hand over his tracks and lead audio designer Chad Mossholder would quote, assemble the final OST. Gordon said that he didn't hear the final soundtrack until it was released. When he finally listened to it, he said his heart sank. He claimed that alongside the tracks that he submitted were, quote, an additional 47 tracks made by poorly editing together bits and pieces taken from my in-game score. After the public backlash, Gordon said he had a Skype confrontation with Stratton, with Gordon being angry about the additional 47 tracks and Stratton accusing him of, quote, failing to take ownership. Uh, Mick Gordon said they finally agreed to release a joint statement, that's Mick and Marty Stratton, to address the situation and detail their plans to fix the album. Instead, Mick Gordon said, Stratton released the Reddit post that we just talked about lambasting Gordon. Man saying just just hold on we'll do this together and then whoosh just knife through the ribs yeah. uh at least that's you know that's the version of the story we have now uh and from our perspective that's where the story ended we saw the reddit post everything seemed to just kind of 
move on from there. But for McGordon, that's where the story went legal. No oh boy, there ain't no beef like a legal beef. Charlotte, stake us up. That's right. Put on those napkins and bang your fork and steak knife on the table. Dinner's served. Once Gordon realized he'd been publicly thrown under the bus, he had his legal representative contact Zenimax Studios, who quickly offered to settle once he'd presented his case. Just immediately. <laughs> Unfortunately, the settlement negotiations derailed once both parties started talking terms. Tragically, these discussions involved Gordon producing a new proper Doom Eternal OST in addition to a full payout for his Doom Eternal music at some point. Ah, he could have gotten paid and we would have gotten a full OST and it just seems like everyone could have won there. Uh. Yeah, you'd think, but apparently negotiations completely broke down regarding Marty Stratton's Reddit post. Gordon wanted the post removed to help exonerate his name. Stratton's lawyers argued that removing the post would make it seem like Stratton was admitting guilt, thus damaging his reputation. Once Gordon made it clear that any settlement would require removal of the Reddit post, negotiations turned aggressive. Stratton's lawyers then threatened to sue Gordon while also proposing an entirely new settlement. You, jeez. Oh, I know, dirty. Dirty and messy and dirty. Uh, this deal included a six-figure sum in exchange for, quote, taking full public responsibility for the failure of the OST. And that's what Mick Gordon wrote. Uh, the Reddit post would remain up indefinitely, the one from Marty Stratton, and Gordon would never be allowed to discuss Doom, the OST, or the Marty Stratton Reddit post ever again. Additionally, Mick Gordon would be prohibited from speaking negatively about Marty Stratton, any ZeniMax employee, or any ZeniMax product forever. Damn, man, that's a gag order and a half. Uh, Gordon was unwilling to accept the permanent gag order, uh, but continued negotiating. Uh, from Gordon's perspective, it's clear that the lawyers then shifted into using stalling tactics at that point. Uh, you know, stuff like setting a meeting and then rescheduling it at the last second or just canceling it. Uh, he said they even would assign work tasks to employees that were on vacation, so they would just go undone, stuff like that. Gordon realized that this process was going nowhere when Stratton's lawyers, after months of negotiation, again simply re-offered the same gag order they had previously. He wrote, After months of delays, meeting cancellations, and postponements, they arrived precisely at the same place they started, which is likely why Gordon is taking the whole story public now. So, summarizing, Mick Gordon wrote that Marty Stratton's statement, the one on Reddit, was quote, full of lies, disinformation, and innuendo, and when challenged, his company offered me a six-figure sum to shut up about it. Uh, Mick Gordon then accused Marty Stratton's post of damaging his reputation, which absolutely it did. And then Mick said that he was, quote, exercising my right to defend myself by publishing the post this week on media. And as you might imagine, this set off a new firestorm over the soundtrack with lots of Doom fans on Reddit flocking to Gordon's defense. It's kind of, it's, it's easy to do, you know. Uh, lots of them rallying around the phrase justice for Mick. Mm -hmm. So to say the least, it's just been a gigantic mess. Mm, messy. Beefy. <laughs> a lot, a lot. That uh, just more or less concludes the actual coverage of the news. But uh, man, is this, this is just a difficult situation to properly comment on or analyze. I mean, we're going to try a little bit, but like it's really tough. Yeah, we don't want to tell you what to think uh, or what to do, even though that's typically how news goes these days. Uh, we'll share our perspectives on the issues in a second, just what we think and feel. First, we want to remind you that this is still just one person's perspective. It's really hard to imagine the script flipping again at this point, but we've thought that before. Yeah, that's true. Uh, just don't make the mistake of believing that just because we now have more information that we now have all of the information. Uh, Marty Stratton and id Software have yet to actually make any statement on this matter. I mean, if they ever do. Yeah, but even if it isn't the complete truth, Going months without pay and being offered hush money to publicly fall on the sword to cover a corporate executive, that's, that's messed up and uh, frustrating, especially when your work reputation has been exploded because of it. So, woof. So now that we've made our disclosures, it's time to ask, what do you, the viewers slash we, all of us, what do we think about all this? I guess the first question is, what should id Software and Bethesda do about this? It's extremely messy. My gut is always to assume that the, uh, the company the massive company is typically the uh, wrongdoer in these situations. Uh, I can't say that for certain, but ZeniMax, you know, seems like it seems very believable that they would not 
pay someone their due and like so many companies do, work with the assets they have already received from an artist and cobble that together into something that would be a finished product. We've seen it happen before with other companies. And so that is, you know, for what it's worth, extremely believable f for my money. I, 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 I think they would have to release a statement if this is true, sort of admitting their wrongdoing and allowing Mick Gordon to sort of recoup some of the public face that he's lost because you know doom fanboys they they they'll it seems very quickly jump to his aid but there's a lot of people that are not quite so plugged in that may have heard the news that he phoned in a ost or something and now i think um monetarily if this is the case he should be uh given his due but also the reputation aspect is really important for somebody who is working in a field like gaming like your your work your your image is everything. The way people think of you is everything. And if you can't get jobs, that's probably a big part of it. Absolutely. Uh, Mick, I read almost all the fourteen thousand words from Mick Gordon this morning. It took me about an hour, and uh, there were a couple of things because I generally absolutely trust Mick Gordon here, and I, I believe what he's saying. I believe his feelings. I believe his reports. However, he did not include proof of uh, his interactions with Marty Stratton. So there are dates and there are times, but there are no actual emails. And there's probably for legal reasons, who knows, but he didn't include that. So I don't know how Marty Stratton wrote to him. And I don't know how Mick Gordon wrote to him either. So Mick Gordon sort of showed his side of things, but never really Marty Stratton's. Now I'm expecting Marty Stratton to come out <laughs> and show the emails. Um, I, I truly am because I feel like if they're going to try and fight this, that'd probably be the only way and then leave it up to the audience to decide. Um, but uh, that said, again, I still side with Mick on this one. I, I generally, like Charlotte said, I generally side with the artist. I almost never side with the company. So, And I, I believe uh, in the fact that he's just trying to defend his reputation. I guess I'm just trying to divine why this became such a problem. Um, Marty Stratton is a, a very long time employee at Ed Software. Uh, he's one of the, like, the old dogs, which could explain why he's being protected. Maybe he's just kind of known or trusted up the uh, executive chain. But uh, at this point, like, the refusal to, to back down from the Reddit post thing really does imply that Stratton has some leverage, and he's allowed to kind of swing Zenimax's lawyers. So that's bizarre to me. I, <laughs> I don't know why they didn't just firmly ask Marty to back the fuck down and just make all this go away. So now I have to wonder, all right, if Marty's that protected or that important, how do we fix this? Um, because right now it is, since this has happened now, it is very much one or the other has to go down. Like one or the other is going to be seen as a liar in the public eye. So all I can figure if Stratton is part of a good old boys club, then just move him to some executive layer. That's not public facing. Don't talk about it. Never acknowledge it. Uh, Stratton still gets to be an executive director on something. Uh, and, and maybe people will forget and then public facing to get your PR back. You pay Mick Gordon, you produce a new Doom OST, you release it for everybody, and then hopefully everybody's head gets pat and the the shitty dudes still protect each other. That's all I can figure cynically thinking how this could like resolve in a way that benefits the most people. Yeah, I... The fact that Stratton public, public, published that shit publicly, first of all, was just like, you just don't do that. You don't do that ever. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm surprised he did. And clearly it was the wrong call because it's just coming back. He could have he could have handled that quietly and privately. Uh, and Stratton Stratton kind of did escalate it here, even though Gordon was already saying some stuff about it. So it sucks, uh, which kind of brings me to my next point or my next open question. Us, the gamers, the ones who are directing, we hold the reins of the world in our hands, uh, which it normally looks like a controller, but do we have any obligation here to change the way that we behave or to monitor our consumption so that we're not rewarding bad practices in this way? It, it's a really fuzzy question. I'm just curious what you guys think about it because there's been a lot of calls to there's been a lot of calls to ethical consumption with Hel Helena Taylor saying boycott Bayonetta, people calling for like boycotting of Blizzard Entertainment products and stuff like that. Where do you guys? What do you guys think about? Uh, activism and consumption i uh, as much as i would love for you know collective action in the the gaming community to be able to fight these behemoths of companies i think it, when it comes to personal responsibility you can act in accordance with your own beliefs and and the way you feel about things but i don't think we have a system where you can expect like a a full 
like a full tilt boycott to change the behavior of a big company. I think by and large, a lot of people are kind of just checked out like, and just like getting games and playing them, which is like, I would say probably the normal way to be and not everyone's, you know, constantly consuming gaming news. So like, I, I think if this doesn't sit well with you, I think do, you know, you the viewer do what you think is best as a consumer. But uh, I mean, I, I don't know. It sucks because I don't want to say like, don't bother boycotting, but like the cynic in me says it's never going to like pick up the steam you would want it to. That's well put. I That's exactly right. Um, Cause I've thought a lot about this with a lot of different ethical consumptions that I would like to do like Blizzard Entertainment or Activision or whatever. And uh, the thing that I always sort of come back to cause I've spoken to people on those teams and, and just developers in general is that these products are made by hundreds and sometimes thousands of people. So if we if we boycott it affects hundreds or thousands of people and it, it is also a, a generally a pretty effective way to get the attention of the executives at those companies however a bunch of other people suffer because of it so uh what i am saying and i know this is a cop-out answer but it really truly is uh, the case for everybody you've got to decide for yourself you just that's the only way to do this if you think that boycotting is the right way to go then do it um, and I will absolutely support you in your decision. And if you think that, you know what, I'm going to do a, I'm going to raise money for charity while also playing this game or whatever, do that. Um, there are lots of different ways to go about it, but it really truly is up to you. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to play the Harry Potter game coming out because, there you, you go. know, yeah. JK Rowling is a transphobic bigot who is still going to profit off of this, but I can't begru begrudge everyone else for playing it because I would go insane. You can only control exactly. what you can control. And and if you start to think generally about how what effect you can have on the tides of an entire industry, you're going to lose your mind out there. And well said. <laughs> yep. but we just need more social media brigading, I guess. I, I mean, I hate to think about it, but it's like that's like the <laughs> one tool that seems to actually sometimes change executives minds you just make it really uncomfortable for them on social media for long enough and now they'll all be verified <laughs> yeah well yeah now we can all be verified and shove it around so yeah i don't know it i'm just thinking like in terms of cause and effect the snyder cut happened and it was actually kind of good and sonic got <laughs> fixed and like some of these things whenever people make their opinions known in mass it actually does move needles for the better um so it's tough because it you see you when you acknowledge it that way, it sounds like you're encouraging a lot of social media negativity over dumb stuff. So I don't know. It just, I guess it comes back to personal decisions and, uh, and where the masses move. Yeah, these are really, really tough questions. Uh, and that's why I always kind of leave it up to like what you would do. Um, and you know, like don't shame anybody else for what they're going to do because everyone's got their own lines. So, uh, you know, control what you can control, which is your own behavior. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, if you put the screws to, you know, whatever id on social media and it affects them and they rehire Mick Gordon and they give him his money and all that stuff, great. Uh, but oftentimes people put the screws to companies, not oftentimes, I mean, 98% of the time people put the screws to companies on social media, doesn't make a difference. So it's, who knows what will change. Yeah, we can only change batman and uh, sonic the hedgehog <laughs> the, we live, the this is the worst feature I, that's true oh man all right so here are some patrons we'd like to thank specifically for helping us escape the entertainment business <laughs> uh brian cosner stephen winston loveless and joshua smith and i'd like to thank my patrons for supporting us far more reliably than any company Jeez, i think machinima went like six months without paying me once cool stuff <laughs> anyway thank you very much is what oh, i had one of those yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh pit strip guthrie leith aiden foley and nick calderon appreciate it 